Here's to whiskey kisses, the peachy taste of sin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the first Friday of the month, and that means only one thing. It's whiskey time. Whiskey Folk and welcome back once again to the official Dram Association YouTube channel. We are here in the Strath studio ready for another Scotch Malt Whiskey Society outturn. I'm your host Adam Bradshaw and this is going to be cool. So just like last month, these whiskies are actually already available right now at strathlicker.com. You can go to strathlicker.com forward slash SNWS and pick up these bottles if there are any remaining. Um, we are not launching them as we go through the video because, exciting news, if you haven't already heard, in-person tastings are back on here at the Strath, at least temporarily, whilst the uh, COVID numbers are, you know, in relative safety here on the island. If things start to change, we're definitely, you know, going to keep things safe and uh, um, go back online only if necessary. But whilst we're safely able to do so, we will continue doing our in-person tastings. And speaking of in-person tastings, we've actually already done one at the time of recording. For the first time here on Drinking Out Loud, I'm not going to be opening fresh brand new bottles of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskey for an outturn. I'm afraid we're going to have to just cope with the fact that they're already open. But that's fine. Um, it's actually really going to be quite interesting because for the first time ever, I actually know what all of these whiskies taste like because I presented them uh, live in person on Sunday. Um, and yeah. So I'm actually going to present them again uh, later on today. Um, I'm, I'm recording this on Thursday, ready for Friday morning's big release. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I went in relatively blind on Sunday. I didn't know much about the whiskies. And uh, a couple of them that uh, I think, I, I think a couple of them um, deserve a little bit more attention than maybe we uh, we gave them collectively um, on, uh, on Sunday, um, especially especially number one, and that's where we're going to start off today. Number one is called, and I'm sorry for the French accent here, Vitam Vitamine. I don't know how to say vitamin in French. V vitamin, it's something vaguely French sounding. Vit vitamine, vitamine de table um, is what I'm going for. Um, or in Yorkshire, vitamin de table. Um, yeah. Uh, the nose opens with buttery shortbread, soft cereals, cake dough, and freshly baked chocolate croissants. Add to that whipped cream, baled hay, straw mats, canola oil, shoe polish, and mandarin liqueur. With a splash of water, out comes green tea, elegant burlap notes, honey melon, heather flowers, honeysuckle, pollen, citrus-infused mineral water, and rum-soaked toffee sponge. The palate at full strength offers cooking oil, barley sugars, caramelized figs, milk bottle candies softened in a warm pocket, sultanas in muesli, and yeast extracts. With water, there are lovely subtle notes of mint tea, clove oil, white asparagus, pear drops, cotton candy, tree bark, apple sauce, and eucalyptus tobacco. Some orange vitamin tablets fizz in the finish. 
it's a very interesting whiskey to start on. Um, and I think that was part of the thing on Sunday is it, 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 it was unexpectedly, I think, deep for a starting whiskey. It was a lot to chew on here. It wasn't, you know, often a starting whiskey, it's uh, at the outturns and in whiskey tastings in general are something a little bit more, you know, um, maybe a slightly simpler flavor profile, something that's just, you know, zesty candy kind of flavors. This is all over the shop and it's it's really interesting. Um, let's find out what it is, shall we? So, Vitamin de Table. See, the pop's still pretty good, right? Doesn't have to be a fresh one every time. Here we go. First whiskey of the day. Definitely won't be the last. Mmm. Honeysuckle straight up on the nose today. That's interesting. I'm not sure they mentioned really anything honeysuckle. Did, maybe they did. Baled hay, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Baled hay. I like that. Whipped cream, yeah. It, it is weirdly creamy as well. I think one thing that really uh, juts out that I, uh, I noticed on the palate last time is when they say yeast extracts, I don't know if this is what they mean, but I automatically equate yeast extract to Marmite. Um, and there is that little bit of a salty salinity that I got on the palate before. I'm really intrigued to see if I get it again today. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah, that is, that is cakey. That is really cakey. Much more so than I remember it being. I think uh, having a, a few days of uh, headroom in the bottle, well, <laughs> large headroom in the bottle there, is really, um, has really helped this, uh, this whiskey come to life even more. That is, mm, it's a little bit like a Battenberg cake. It's got this almondy cake dough thing. That's really, mm, and buttery pastry. It's like, an, it's like a, on a Bakewell tart without the cherry. Or at least I can't find the cherry. Maybe there is cherry. Mm. So I know some of you are probably trying to strain your eyes and see all the information on the bottle. Let's go through it, shall we? So this is cask 35.246, one of 216 bottles. It was distilled on the 27th of October, 1995. It is from a first fill barrel, ex bourbon, it is a Speyside whiskey at 52.5% ABV and is presented to you at 23 years old. Aged for 23 years. That's um, quite the starting whiskey. And I know a lot of people have been asking me what happened to the old 35s, because 35 is a number that cropped up ooh, probably every three months or so, um, a, good, a few years ago, and there's very good reason for that. We'll get to that uh, in a second. Um, but it's been a long time since we've seen an older 35, so it's a, a very welcome addition to the outset and a very interesting thing to start off with. It uh, certainly gets your mouth watering for what's to come. Mandarin liqueur, eh? Now, one thing I didn't get to try because I was, uh, you know, presenting and wrestling with putting a mask on and off in between sips on uh, at the uh, at the tasting on Sunday is I didn't actually manage to try most of these with water, and this is one that I didn't. So let's try that right now. Let's get the old trusty pipette. Just a couple of drops is all you need. Let's see. Beautiful. Hmm. So I realized I didn't do my standard what on earth the SNWS thing is in the introduction. If by now you don't know what the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is, do yourself a favor and go to snws.ca. They have all of the details you could possibly need. Uh, if you're in Victoria or uh, elsewhere in BC, then check out strath.com, um, sorry, strathlicker.com forward slash snws, and we've got all the local information as well. Hmm. Okay, so let's discuss Distillery 35, shall we? Who is it and what are they all about? Well, it's Glen Moray, and Glen Moray is a really interesting distillery. Um, they specialize in first fill American oak these days, um, especially with the new owners. Um, but they also were one of the very first distilleries to experiment with white wine casks, which is really cool. And we have had a couple of those pass through in the SNWS as well. They've experimented with Chardonnay and Chenin Blanc and, and the like. The interesting thing, and one of the reasons is, uh, I, I, uh, I hinted out earlier that we had quite a few of these in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, is 
for a brief period, they were actually owned by the same company. SMWS, uh, as many of you will know, started by Pit Pills, is uh, very much independent in its origin, and uh, then was for a short period actually owned by Louis Vuitton, who owned Ardbeg and Glenmorangie and Glenmore. And uh, Louis Vuitton kind of weirdly ignored Glenmore and actually, I think, did them a huge disservice by branding them as a, a cheap whiskey. Um, and people in the know knew that, you know, it's not a cheap whiskey, it's just a really underpriced whiskey. And apparently Louis Vuitton actually kind of lost money on the distillery, which is probably one of the reasons that they since sold it to, uh, and I'm going to butcher this French pronunciation as well, La Martinique, La Martinique Quasse. Um, I, I really should learn French for these, shouldn't I? Um, but yeah, uh, since then, of course, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society is back in uh, independent ownership. Uh, we're no longer part of the Louis Vuitton family. Um, and yeah, neither is Glenmore. So the uh, the Glenmore stocks that the SNWS had are either gone and we're now getting new stocks or very much dwindling at this point. And as such, it's, it's we don't get to see them anymore. And the good news for Glenmore as well is that since being uh, under the new owners, they've managed to really refresh their image and uh, give... They've, they've been given a new lease in life and they're no longer being presented as the weird supermarket budget whiskey um, that it had no right to ever being uh, displayed as. Um, it's now, you know, a solid, really good contender. I mean, it's it's uttered in the same breath as things like Glen Grant. It's that kind of, you know, if you're in the know, you know about it and it's really good, but it's not, you know, those super well-known whiskeys. Uh, so yeah, it's really nice to see another quite old Glenmore here from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Thank you very much, Robin Kelly, for bringing this one in. Um, yeah, really enjoy it. Mm. I'll go back and try this one a little, a little bit later. Mm. All right, next on the docket we have... Oh, actually, I should tell you the price, shouldn't I? I keep forgetting that we're not releasing these at the end. This is already for sale right now. If, if you feel like getting a Vitamin de Table, you can pick one up for three fifty nine oh four at strathlicker.com. So if you head to strathlicker.com forward slash SNWS, you'll find it right there. Or you can just go to the homepage and search for um, 35.246 in the in the little search bar at the top. Or even Vitamin de Table. Either will work. You should be able to find it. If you don't find it, it means it's sold out. So sorry about that. But you can see everything that's still available at the SNWS page. All right, whiskey number two today. Let's move you, I don't know, over here. Whiskey number two today is Juicy Fruit Meets Big Red. And this is an interesting one because the amount of times that um, people call out the SNWS for having very UK-centric uh, sort of sweeties or candy names, um, it's uh, it happens quite a lot in North America because no one knows what on earth like a chomp is, for example, or a curly whirly. Um, but I actually had no, I, I didn't really understand the whole juicy fruit and big red thing. They're, they're probably available in the UK, but they're certainly not apparently as um, part of the culture as they are here. Everyone in the room knew what they were apart from me. Um, so I have since done my homework and I've tried a bit of juicy fruit and big red. So unlike Sunday, I'm going to see if I can actually find some in this whiskey. Let's find out. But first, the official SNWS tasting notes. An amazing dram for its age. It filled our nostrils with fruity citric floral notes, apple turnover, tutti fruity ice cream, lemon cake, elderflower, and fruit mentos. We also got fresh cut wood, but it was mainly perfumed and attractive. The palate was fruity and exotic. Peach, nectarine, caramelized pineapple, fruit gums, and pears cooked in honey with clove and cinnamon. The finish also warmed up with pepper and licorice lozenges. The reduced nose, jelly babies, sherbet straws, peach, flan, and fudge with cherry pieces. The palate now wowed us with rhubarb and custard sweets, chewing pineapple, ice lolly sticks, juicy fruit, and big red. Oh, I do love rhubarb and custard sweets. That, that, that got me going when I first read them. I don't think that's a thing you can find in Canada very often. But yes, now I know what juicy fruit and big red are all about. Let's see if I can find some in juicy fruit meets big red. <laughs> So as you can tell from the get-go, there's a big number eight. I don't know if you can read anything else on the screen there, but yeah, we're looking at an eight-year-old here. 
This one is from the Speyside region once again, and again, a first fill barrel. So a really interesting experience being able to try two first fill barrel whiskies from the same region that are actually 15 years apart in age. So that's, that's kind of a cool little side-by-side -side for us as well. Mm. Very nice. So the thing I got before was um, like hubba bubba, like bubble gum. Um, and I have to admit, juicy fruit chewing gum is not too dissimilar in flavor. Uh, it's a maybe a little bit more fruity and a little less, like, I don't know what, I, I don't, I have literally no idea what flavor bubble gum is. I think they just created their own flavor. I don't think, it, I don't, I'm not sure if it's trying to be anything else. But the other thing I get on the nose on this one is those candied bananas. It doesn't smell anything like an actual banana, but those little foam candy ones. which apparently are what bananas used to taste like before they all died and we have a different gene of banana now. Mm. Mm. Ooh, it might have been because I was staring at the words as I took that sip. Apple turnover. This tastes, wow, that's a memory. This tastes like the old version of McDonald's apple pies. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if that was. I assume that was a thing in North America. Um, it was a very big thing in the UK back in the in the good old days. McDonald's apple pies were actually deep fried, um, and they were crispy, and it was like molten apple lava in the middle, and it tastes like this. It's nice crispy pastry dough and like an apple jam. Wow, that's a. I kind of forgot they used to do that. weird that they've gone baked now. I don't, I don't like it. Mm. I don't think I've ever brought McDonald's up in a tasting note for a whiskey before. Mm. I'm sure they're very happy for the, uh, the, the free advertising. Mm. Yeah, that's really, that's really good. And again, didn't get to try this one with water previously, so I'll do that now. I did mention though, because it's, it does say in this one, the reduced nose. And I know there's a couple of members who were actually quite confused for several months and uh, were too embarrassed to ask about it. Uh, but when they say reduced, they literally mean adding water. Uh, they're not like, one of them thought they were making like a, a reduction, you know, like in cooking, they were boiling it off. Like, no, 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 no one's boiling off the whiskey to smell it again later. No, no, don't worry. We're just adding a couple of drops of water. That's as much reduction as it needs. Alrighty. Nice. Distribution of oils there. It's uh, yeah, it's that's really uh, huh. it looks a lot more viscous with the water added than it actually feels in the mouth. That's interesting. I wonder if uh, sometimes when you add water, it actually then tastes a lot more. Um, not tastes, but has a much more waxy mouth feel. Mm. Yeah. So eight years old from the 1st of August, 2011, one of 221 bottles this time with an ABV of 57.4. This is 71.68. And 71 is a distillery we, again, haven't seen in quite a while here in the SWS, but we have had a few times, is Glenbergi. And Glenbergi is actually one of the three pillars on which the second best-selling uh, whiskey of all time um, is, is built on. That whiskey, Valentine's, a uh, very, very popular whiskey blend. Um, it was apparently originally called Kiln Flat, um, which is, I kind of I like the name Kiln Flat. I kind of wish they'd go back to it. Glenbergi sounds, I don't know, I think it's just one, it's one step too close to Glenbogi, and that just doesn't sound right. Or Glenbooger, I guess, would be in North America. I don't know, do you say bogey or booger here in Canada? I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyway, Kiln Flat, cool name. I like Kiln Flat. A lot of these names that like original uh, original distillery names are kind of rubbish, and you can definitely see why they changed them. Like Burn Foot, uh, Kiln Flat sounds really cool. Um, I reckon they should go back. Yeah, there's a bit of a there is a bit more of a powdered sugar jelly baby. Yeah, I can see jelly babies coming out on that actually. Hmm, very nice. Oh, and there's the cinnamon. Didn't really get much cinnamon at all until I actually had, um, until I'd actually had it with water. Um, yeah, big red. There we go. Very nice. And yeah, I mean, 
juicy fruit, you kind of understand the flavours. Even if you've never had juicy fruit in your life, it tastes a bit like juicy fruit, but with that slight weird artificial flavour. Um, and this does have... I wouldn't say it's got a weird artificial flavour, but it's definitely got many juicy fruit flavours. The peaches and nectarines it mentioned are, are very, very much playing around in my, uh, on my palate right now. Yeah, very nice indeed. Again, this one is for sale right now. You don't have to wait. I think it's available right now. And it is $139.04. And as I'm saying that out loud, it feels like a typo, but I've said it right now. I've already sold a few bottles, assumedly at this price, because that's what's written in the book. So $139.04 it is. It sounds ridiculously good value, to be honest. Um, if you, yeah, if you're not sure which one to get and this sounds like the one for you, I recommend buying two. <laughs> um, actually, I don't recommend buying two. You probably shouldn't buy two because um, I can't imagine this is going to last too long at that price. That's, uh, yeah, I, should, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't encourage people buying two of these bottles. We need to make sure that members get a fair share. But very good. If you come back tomorrow and there's still one, buy another. How's that? Mm. Yeah, big fan of that. You know, as much as I re mm, as much as I really, really enjoy that Glenmore, and I think that a lot of people are gonna really enjoy that. It's it's got that uh, that beautiful, um, beautiful, delicate note that you already get in all the whiskies. Um, I think for me, I slightly, I definitely prefer the Glenburgie in terms of value, just because it's such a good price. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I like both of them quite a lot, actually. It's a, it's a really good, strong start to the uh, to the answer. Uh, number three, however, is actually our designated repeat of the month, and I don't always include those in the videos, but I feel like uh, I feel like doing so this time, so I, I will. Uh, this one is actually from only a couple of months ago, um, but seeing as we've got the in-person tastings, I wanted to give people uh, the uh, ability to come in and try it because, to be brutally honest, we didn't sell. I don't think we sold. Any, maybe one bottle when this was first released. Uh, maybe I uh, didn't do it justice enough in the video. Maybe people just didn't uh, didn't quite jam with the uh, the flavor um, profile that was being described to them at the time. I'm, I'm not sure, um, but this went down really quite well on uh, on Sunday, and I'm sure it'll go down well again tonight. And I I really I, I think uh, I think this is a hidden little gem. Um, I mean, in no way um, do I think it's the best whiskey of either the original outturn or this outturn but i think it's it, it could be many people's favorites um it's got a really really nice flavor profile and let's explore that one now this is bodybuilders in bowl gowns a delicately scented veil of ladies perfume shrouded bold aromas that smacked the senses with cinnamon and sanded oak enjoying bags of character we soon found ourselves bench pressing tea cakes and deadlifting marshmallows on a floor of dusty tobacco and biscuit crumbs then the palate muscled its way in with a full punch bag of fresh ginger, sweet spices, and aniseed. After a refresh and a dash of water, we found ourselves back again in powerful perfumes, but this time alongside crushed nettles in a herb garden and assorted biscuits laced with vanilla. Sweet honey began to emerge with a spice that built from nutmeg and ginger to cinnamon and camphor, whilst on the finish we found big and heavy-hitting wood. And I know they mean, you know, the flavour of... A oak in there, but I'm just imagining a giant wooden mallet just smacking you. Um, yeah, really, really nice whiskey that I think went a, a little bit unnoticed um, back a couple of months ago when it was released and people weren't able to try it. So don't don't miss out on this guy. It's definitely worth your attention. Mm. All right, so what is Bodybuilders in Ball Gowns? Well, it is cask 95.36. It is again a space side. This time it's a second filled barrel and it's nine years old. So um, is that a year older than the last one? The last one was eight, right? Uh, yeah, so one year older than our last whiskey and using a different type of barrel. A second fill rather than a first fill. And that's that, that's something I want to address as well. I, I talked about this a lot with refill casks um, on I think the last video. Um, there's nothing wrong with a second filled barrel, and in, in many cases it can add an extra layer of interesting complexity to a whiskey because, I mean, a first filled barrel it isn't, it's not, it's not a virgin barrel, it's the first filled since it's had bourbon in it, right? A second filled barrel, that's, 
that means it's, yeah, it's had some bourbon in it, it's going to infuse some flavours, but it's also had a scotch in it afterwards. And that scotch that was the previous inhabitants of the barrel is also going to add another layer of interesting notes uh, that got soaked into the wood that is now, you know, then soaks into this whiskey and, you know, adds a little bit to the Solera vatting process in a guess, in a sense. I mean, it's not an actual Solera vat because Solera vats, you know, you have to leave liquid in to be a Solera vat, but it's the same kind of idea in the sense that you're passing on the flavours from previous um, inhabitants. It's, yeah, an, an interesting interesting thing to note. You can char the hell out of a whiskey, but some of those flavors, uh, whiskey, out of a barrel, but some of those flavors are still gonna transfer. Even if you do a, a heavy rechar and a heavy toast, um, you're not gonna get rid of all of the whiskey that's soaked into that wood because wood is porous. That's kind of, kind of the point. Anyway, what is Distillery 95? <sighs> I'm gonna tell you after I've enjoyed some of it. I'm getting tobacco, quite a lot of tobacco. It does mention a floor of dusty tobacco and biscuit crumbs. I didn't get that anywhere near as strongly previously, but yeah, that is, that's quite nice. It's, um, you know, with all the notes of strong character, tobacco, um, cakes and perfumes, I'm somewhat surprised this is not like some kind of mother-in-law whiskey. Um, I'm, uh, you yeah. know, maybe, Maybe that's just my interpretation of mother-in-laws, and it's very warped. I'm not sure. Um, not not that my my not that my, either my ex wife's mum, who I unfortunately never met, nor my current girlfriend's mum, have anything to do with those tasting notes. It's just from I don't know years of watching sitcoms. <laughs> hmm. Mmm. Mmm. It is. It's like a small without the chocolate. Or maybe maybe a small but with a, a very thin piece of dark chocolate instead of the big glob of milk chocolate that usually ends up on there. Mmm. But yeah, there's, there's definitely some kind of cigar smoke going on around there as well now. That's nice. That's really, that's really quite pleasant. Yeah. So Distillery 95 is a distillery that if you were watching the last video or uh, came to the uh, Douglas Lang in the spotlight, um, you might be familiar with because we had one at that tasting as well. This is an athresque. Unlike that one, this is a younger side of the athresque. As, as we noted, this is nine years old um, rather than the 15 year old we had last week. But uh, yeah, this is really uh, a really interesting distillery because a lot of people have this preconceived notion that, especially in the Speyside region, all of the distilleries are like really antiquated old distilleries from you know the 1800s or earlier even. Um, and that's just not true. And I think uh, as you're about to see on this image, you're, you're about to see some proof of that. Also check out the cars, because I think they match the distillery perfectly. The architecture is just pure. 1970s and this was built in 1972 and it was built by IDV for their J and B blend a blend which uh, I I had mentioned um, actually I think I mentioned at the outset and at last week's tasting for uh, the Douglas Lang one that we don't stock the J and B blend here and I, I didn't even know if it was available in, in BC I haven't really looked because I've never once been asked for it but it is actually a really really popular whiskey um, and in fact many of our members talked about drinking an awful lot of it in the 80s, which is probably when it was at its peak popularity before being sort of taken over much more so by Johnny Walker, which uh, the co-owners uh, of Johnny Walker and J&B Diageo co-owners, the owners of both this, uh, both blends rather. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that it's kind of dropped off. Um, and we just, I don't, I can't remember really seeing it much over here. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's available. If anyone wants J&B, ask me to bring it in and I will bring it in. I literally haven't brought it in because I haven't had a single person asking for it. Um, Athrusk, though, we've uh, we've had some fantastic um, Athrusks come through our doors. Interesting thing about Athrusk is, yes, it was, it was made specifically for blending, but they did release it as a single malt about 10 years after it was built. And it was actually the original Singleton, uh, a brand now which is reserved for three malts, the Singleton of Dufton, the Singleton of uh, Glen... Oh man, I've already forgotten. Um, the symbol of the, the singleton of Glen something. I'm, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting all the all the singletons. Uh, Glen Ord. 
and there's Glen something else as well. Singleton of Dufton, Singleton of Glenord, Singleton of Glen... Tell me in the comments. I mean, I'm sure I'll remember it in about three minutes, because it's definitely something I know that just, I just can't bring to mind right now. But the Singletons, you, you know them, right? There, um, there, there's three different distilleries under one brand where different parts of the world get a different expression. Uh, we normally get the uh, the the Dufton here, I think, um, although we see the Glenord occasionally in uh, special editions. Um, but normally the Glenord is over in, in Asia. Um, it, it'll come to me. Um, but yeah, this was the original Singleton, um, but it was stripped of that title after um, after a few years because I think as as much as uh, the, the Singleton of a Thrust did really quite well, um, not necessarily in sales per se, but definitely in reputation, uh, they needed the whiskey for the blends. Uh, they just didn't really... They, they felt like it, it wasn't worth the effort of presenting it as a single malt for... Um, for the effort that it took, uh, and for the fact that they then couldn't make as much blended whiskey. Uh, that, that's fair, I guess. Um, it's known to be quite spicy and nutty, um, and that actually comes from um, their technique. They do a rapid mashing, a really quick fermentation, and then when they uh, when they distill uh, the first time, when they, uh, they're in the, in the, in the mash still there, uh, in the wash still, um, they actually distill it at a really, really high temperature, uh, which is really cool. Uh, yeah. So this has been available, is available, unless it's sold out already by the time you reach this video, for one sixty nine forty eight. Hmm. And it's absolutely lovely. Hmm. All right, back to the regular scheduled programming. We are back to the new release, and whiskey number four today is called Curry Corner. Curry Corner. A basket of orchard fruits, um, at first with apples, pears, and plums, followed by a little more exotic papaya and star fruit, eventually developing into nettle tea served with rhubarb scones. On the palate, neat however, we got an Indian curry called Lamb Rogan Josh, with cinnamon, coriander, and I, s s I can't remember what this was. I think I think Lawrence actually looked it up on his phone to tell everyone. Um, Asafoetida powder, it's probably some kind of spice. Um, garlic and ginger. Uh, when adding water, we moved to Thailand, and the smell of kaffir, lime leaves, lemongrass, and a variety of spices made us all prepare a chicken red curry, which, just before serving with jasmine rice, we sprinkled with basil leaves. Mm. This is from the really Spicy and Dry collection, and is again nine years old, and uh, is very, very different to the last nine-year-old. Let's give it a try again. I really liked this one. I, I decided by the end of the tasting I really liked this one. I was I think I was a little bit confused by the flavors to start off with, and I think a few people were. Actually, funny thing about this whiskey is on Sunday's tasting, uh, we had four bottles available. Um, we sold the first three. Um, uh, people put their hands up as we tasted it, and they got it. By the end of the tasting, I got to the part where I show everyone all the whiskeys and we, you know, we thank the SNWS and have a round of applause and I say, if anyone wants any of the other ones that are still available, let us know now and we'll give you a ticket so you can purchase it. And we actually ended up having a draw for the last bottle because three people in the, in, you know, the very small COVID-friendly crowd that we had um, put their hand up wanting the last bottle of this one. So it did end up actually going to a draw, which is kind of cool. But I think one of the things that, potentially confuse people is the idea of garlic as a note in whiskey and it's something that I hadn't hadn't really come across much before and I it it sounds slightly off-putting but I think when I finally realized that yeah it's garlic not in like a uh like a hummusy like big roasted garlic sense because that sounds kind of odd it's garlic like the garlic shoots, you know, the green bits that we sometimes put in a salad. It's like this fresh peppery garlic. Um, and I actually really, really like it. It's a really interesting spice note to find in a whiskey, uh, where normally the spice notes are, you know, you've got paprika, cumin, cinnamon, those, those kind of things. This one, it really, yeah, it really surprised me. And I, I really quite like it. We also talked an awful lot about the new curry restaurant around the corner. If you do live in Victoria, do yourself a favor. Um, 
get yourself on Uber Eats or, um, or Skip the Dishes or whatever app you want to use and get yourself some, uh, some Curry Club. It's a new Indian restaurant that's opened up just around the block from us and it is absolutely fantastic. Some of the best curry I've had in Canada. Um, also, if you're on Skip the Dishes, you can also get, uh, get uh, Sticky Wicket food now on Skip the Dishes, which is kind of cool. Um, they actually have a, a lasagna for four deal where you can buy and skip the dishes. It's a lasagna meal big enough for four people, includes a full lasagna, uh, which is the pasta is actually made in house. I was just actually watching some of the kitchen staff um, roll it out, which is why it came to mind. They actually make homemade pasta here, which is something, something that a lot of people don't realize. Not even Pagliacci's makes their own pasta anymore. Uh, but yeah, we make our own pasta in-house for the uh, for lasagna, and you can get it delivered to you, um, including um, a, a side salad, a, I think a Caesar salad for, uh, for everyone, and garlic bread. It's like 55 bucks or something, which is a really, really good way of doing a nice family, uh, family meal. Anyway, <laughs> back to the uh, curry corner. Yeah. Big orchard fruit on the nose. And I didn't really get into the, um, into those spices until I got to the palate, so... Mmm. Yeah. Oh, the coriander is really, really quite present today. I see where they're going with the lamb rogue and josh as well. It's, mmm. It's savory, sweet. It's sweet and savory. It's it's one of those things where it's like a it's like one of those dishes where if you're you're not familiar with the with, with the style of dish and it's got an ingredient in it, you think that's not right. Like I once had a, uh, a fruit salad that had cherry tomatoes in it, and it's like, that sounds wrong, but it was absolutely fantastic. Or when you sometimes, like, and that happens a lot in Indian food, like you get like curries, which are in you know, a mango sauce. And it's like, well, that sounds really sweet and disgusting. You don't want chicken with mango. Ugh. And then you try it and you're like, oh my God, that was so good. Give me five more helpings. Um, it, it's, it's just like that. So we're back to first field barrel again on this one. So again, I'm assuming ex bourbon. I think it probably says on here. Yep, it says ex bourbon on the bottle, not in the booklet, but it does on the bottle. Uh, from the 23rd of September 2008, nine years old, one of 232 bottles this time, and an ABV of 60.4. Mm. Very, very nice indeed. And if you would like to pick one of these up, of course, just because it's sold out at the tasting doesn't mean it's sold out when you're watching this video necessarily, because we are saving. Uh, around a third of each new release to put on our web store for those of you who can't make it to the in-store tastings, whether um, geographically you can't make it or whether you can't make it because of uh, um, COVID-related reasons. And that is completely fair, and we are trying to support that. So yes, please do pick one of these up from the web store. I will warn you, you should do so sooner rather than later because the two people who didn't win the draw on the uh, Sunday night tasting, Sunday afternoon tasting, definitely intend to be there at eight o'clock when the whiskeys go on sale tomorrow. Eight o'clock is when we're planning to put the whiskeys on sale. Of course, something could go wrong. It could be a little later, but um, of course, I don't really need to tell you that because by the time you're watching this video, that's already happened because the video launches at the same time as the whiskey's coming out. So I'm just rambling for no reason. Get back to drinking, Adam. It's what you're good at. Oh, that is, that is just delicious. Let's see what water does to this little guy. Hmm. Yeah. Not much of a change on the nose, but a sudden burst of citrus notes on the palate there, um, which the book mentions lemongrass. I'm not sure it's exactly lemongrass, but I'm definitely getting like a lime zest. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Um, if you're a fan of spicy and dry whiskies, this is a perfect example of one. And uh, yeah, take one home right now. If you like, go to strathlicker.com forward slash SSMBUS. It should be right there if it's still available. Or you can search in the search bar at the top for Curry Corner. It is 155.57. So an absolute steal of a deal. 155.57 for this whiskey. Mm. Let's move on to the back row. And for those of you who are confused by that phrase, our tasting mats at our tastings have a front row and a back row. And uh, a lot of people get very excited about the back row because that's generally where the bigger, stronger flavors come. 
Uh, the front row is a little bit more light and delicate, which, you know, a good half of the room uh, actually prefer. But I feel like the people, the kind of people that like the big, bold flavors are often the big, bold personalities, and they get very excited about the back row. Um, and the back row is quite exciting today. And we're going to start off with a new acquaintance. A very exciting whiskey indeed. <sighs> you know, I'm ahead of myself again. I've just this second realized I never actually told you what Curry Corner was. So new acquaintance, let me put you on hold for a second there and bring this guy back into the frame. I'm just do a quick rewind and say, hey, this is 58.23. And yeah, you, you, I haven't told you what it is yet. Some of you might know what it is because we had 58.29, strangely, um, earlier this year. It's one of my favorite whiskeys of the year so far. It's called Soul of Plays and Pranks. We still have a couple of bottles left, which are actually going to be on sale this, uh, this coming weekend at our annual whiskey sale. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, but this is 58.23, so it's actually six releases before that. So they've, uh, they've held this one in the reserve for a little while for us. This is a Strathyla. Strathyla Distillery, a, uh, a personal favorite of mine, one of the, uh, the highlights of my whiskey collection at home and one of only about three bottles that I don't actually have open is a very, very old Strathyla. M big fan of the style of whiskey they do there. Um, Strathyla is quite quiet about this fact, but they're actually the oldest licensed distillery um, from 1786. Um, was when they got the license. And although distillers like Glen Turret, I think, says, say, 1785, they weren't licensed back then. So it's, you know, this is the first distillery ever to get a license in Scotland that's still um, that's still making whiskey today, which is really kind of cool. Um, it's found in the Chivas Regal blends. And unlike the last, uh, un unlike the last one, uh, a Thrusk, um, this wasn't, you know, obviously wasn't built for the blend. The distillery came first because it's you know, one of the originals. Um, so Chivas Regal ended up, um, kind of building their blend around this distillery in a sense, rather than having the whiskey be designed for a specific blend. It was originally called Milltown. Um, interesting, interesting first name. Um, and in 1890, the owner of the distillery at the time, whose name was William Longmore, changed its name, not to Longmore, as many people might be thinking, but to Milton. And when I give that trivia tonight, hopefully they'll fall into the trap because I won't tell them what it is. I, I'll give them the trivia first and then and then reveal what it is. Hopefully a lot of people will go, ah, it must be a Milton Duff. Nope. You'd think so, wouldn't you? But no, uh, Milton, or Milltown turned into Milton, which turned into Strathyla. A beautiful whiskey. And again, 155.57 if you'd like some of this Strathyla, which is very good. Back to the new acquaintance. All right, more caught up. A collective ooh, and then awed hush from the panel as we encountered mushroom-accented cough syrup before a big, enveloping hug of old-school oxidative sherry. Touches of aged sherry vinegar, bitter chocolate, damp earthen floor dunnage, pipe tobacco, burlap, lamp oil, game meats, and Christmas cake. A curtain of luscious ranchio, drawn across everything. Add water, and there's dates, prune juice, sooty chimney dust, beef stock, miso broth, old balsamic, sorry, very old balsamic, actually, strawberry laces, pine cones, petrichor, trampled ferns, and a blackcurrant cordial. Some pickled walnuts of bitter espresso, too. The mouth is divine. Old, salty Solera wood. Bitter herb, herbal essences, which I know they mean literal herbal essences, but all I can think of is the shampoo. It doesn't taste anything like shampoo, if you're wondering. Don't worry. There's cumin powder, rye bread, ginger, and nibbling tannins. With water, there's mole sauce, robust nuttiness, the salinity of surf-washed pebbles, green walnut wine. Again, that doesn't sound like a real thing. Um, herbal medicines, caramelized brown sugars, tarragon, and celery salts. Pure, filthily wonderful, old-style sherry perfection. And yes, this is from a refill sherry butt, and it spent its entire time in a refill sherry butt. Uh, that is not a finish. And this is a thing of absolute beauty. And you're about to see it's a special one because it has a picture. And we all love pictures on our whiskeys, don't we? Uh, this picture denotes that it is part of a festival. Uh, I'm not going to tell you right away what that festival is. Uh, leave you guessing for just a couple of seconds. And uh, let's crack her open and see what we're all about. Um, as you can see, it's 14 years old. Look at that color. Isn't that something? Just a beautiful hue. As much as I always say color really doesn't matter, I do, I, like, I just, 
aesthetically like the color of sherry whiskey and it's mostly because orange is my favorite color and it turns out this beautiful ready burnt orange if green was my favorite color maybe i'd like green whiskey who knows i'm getting green whiskey sounds like a just an awful thing it sounds like something went horribly wrong at st patrick's day mm. but yeah this is deep beautiful rich sherry this this is the whiskey that probably you know, was the showpiece, I guess, of the of the outturn. This is one of the ones that went to a draw um, last week on Sunday. I'm sure, it'll go to a draw again tonight. So be quick on the button um, when you uh, try and get this one. Mm. Tastes like the best kind of Christmas cake. Mm. With sherry custard. I don't know if sherry custard's a thing, but it should be. Mm. That's very nice. Actually, less Christmas cake, more Christmas pudding. It's a little, you know, richer, moister. And there is that big umami hit. They mentioned beef stock in the tasting notes. And yeah, I mean, I'm not sure beef stock's quite the direction I would go in, but it's definitely got a big deep umami, almost more like Marmite. And speaking of Marmite, yeah, salty, coastal, beautiful. Maybe having guessed by some of those notes. It's the Isla Festival. This is a Fajil bottling. And it's a Fajil bottling from Distillery 10. This is 10.118, and it's a particularly interesting 10. Um, because for those who are following along and know Distillery 10 quite well, you'll know that the whiskies that we usually get in the SWS from Distillery 10 are a little bit against the typical distillery character. I mean, I know Bunahaven these days are known for similar peated whiskies, uh, the Sio Banach and the Toite Kedar. Um, but, uh, I mean, typically they're unpeated. And we do get quite a few unpeated Bunahavens through the SWS as well. Uh, we get quite a few, but they're almost always bourbon cask. And that, again, is against distillery character because... All, like their unpeated whiskies are known for being sherry casks. So this is a really, really great chance to try a classic style Bunahaven, like the, the style that they aim for for their official bottlings as a single cask SNWS bottling. And you can see why they saved this for a festival bottling because my God, this is special. This is absolutely wonderful. So it's 14 years old, spent the entire 14 years in the refill sherry hut, again from Isla. Um, it's from the 25th of November 2004, so it's about to have a birthday. Um, one of 489 bottles. It's an ABV of 62.5, which is quite high for a 14-year-old whiskey, I would say. I would say it's very high. Um, it's particularly interesting because from a sherry butch, you'd normally get around 600 bottles. So the fact that there's less than 500 and the ABV is quite high is quite confusing. It must have been less from evaporation and more from leakage, I guess, um, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, so, Bunahaven. Uh, it's one of the original Edrington distilleries alongside Glenrothes. Um, they, of course, they were, weren't known as Edrington at the time. They were Highland distillers. Um, and it went into their blends, the, the grouse, uh, especially the famous grouse, uh, not, not the unknown grouse, specifically the famous one. Um, and it went into Cutty Sark as well, uh, later on Black Bottle. Um, this distillery was uh, actually closed down in 1982, believe it or not. They closed Unahaven, the bastards. Um, thankfully, however, it was revived in the late 80s. And once it was revived, they decided to try and see what it'd be like as a single malt rather than just a blending ingredients. And they, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, they actually released it under the nickname The Unpronounceable Malt. Which, seeing as we just had an athrask earlier, which looks like it should be pronounced Hauchroisk, um, yeah, I'm um, I I'm not sure how unpronounceable Bunahaven is, but some people do have trouble with it, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad they did, because Bunahaven, the Bunahaven 12 especially, the official bottling, has been an absolute favourite staple of mine, um, my, basically my entire whiskey drinking life. And uh, it's weird to think that in the early 1980s, it closed. And it's even weirder to think that for the first, you know, hundred, hundred and more years of its life, it wasn't ever released as a single malt. It just seems wrong. Mm. So, 
I've got some bad news for you, because by the time you're watching this, if you didn't already look ahead, there's a very solid chance this one's already sold out. And I'm very sorry about that. Um, but hopefully, um, hopefully that's not the case. Uh, or hopefully some of you have skipped forward or some of maybe some of you have already purchased this and are now watching the video to catch up. Um, if, they, if there are any available, this one is $236.43. Um, steal of a deal, really. Um, that is a really, really good price for this special edition Fragile bottling. Um, I I couldn't be happier with this bottle. I really, it's just, just beautiful. Um, and with that, let's move on to the next dram. And I say dram because the next one isn't a whiskey. Hmm. Okay, so we're moving on to <clears throat> a single cask spirit. What kind of single cask spirit? Ooh, let's see if there's any clues in the name. This one's called Flaming Rum Bananas. Yeah, it's gotta be a gin, right? Plenty of sweetness and spiciness on the nose. Neat. Breadfruit, coconut curry, flaming rum bananas, sautéed in brown sugar, cinnamon and butter, doused with overproof rum and lit. Served over honeycomb ice cream. On the palate, an explosion of pink peppercorns and black cumin seeds before a deep sweetness of rich caramel slices and pomegranate molasses. Coffee cake took center stage. When added a liberal amount of water, which given time developed onto the fruity floral sweetness of a vibrant tropical garden in a rainforest. Just relax on a garden bench and enjoy the piece with iced licorice cinnamon tea and a slice of banana cake. Let's move that one over there and bring out the gin. No, it's not a gin. It's a rum. Don't worry. Yeah, it's a rum. It is a seven-year-old Jamaican rum. A uh, very interesting one that, uh, again, this is one of those, uh, one of those things... When we first actually tasted this on Sunday, people were very hesitant about it. And I think it was a little bit of shock to the system. Like, oh, this, this, this is not a whiskey. And I think we only sold one at the tasting. Um, but then I've had um, <clears throat> at the tasting itself. But then after the tasting, people came up to me and was like, "Do you have any more? Do you have any more tickets for the rum? I want that rum." Um, so we actually ended up, I think, selling out. Maybe uh, I think we did sell out. Uh, I can't quite remember. Uh, but yeah, it was much more popular after people have chewed on it for a second. Because it is a very chewy rum. <laughs> chewy. Sorry, I just made a link in my head. When I first moved to uh, Canada, um, many of you will know that uh, by profession, I'm actually a graphic designer. As you know, I'm, Whiskey is kind of like a second career for me, I guess. Uh, it's definitely my focus now. Um, but when I first moved to Canada, I actually started up a small uh, studio with... Um, uh, another graphic designer called uh, um, Krista McNanny. And we couldn't, for the life of us, decide on what we were going to call our studio. So we decided to use an anagram generator to figure out if there was a cool anagram of our names. And apparently, if you take Adam Bradshaw and... No. Was I Bradshaw back then? I think I might have been doing um, my old um, married name. We combined our surnames to Bayshaw. Um, yeah, that would have done. Um, for the Y. Um, so Adam Bayshaw and Krista McNanny, we actually anagram that together, and the name of our company was My Chewy Bananas, which I still think is an excellent name for a design company. It raised so many questions. Um, yeah, it was always a fun talking point. So, I'm going to enjoy this chewy banana. How am I ever? Oh, there's something about recording a tasting before lunch that Makes me crave the sweet things uh, a little, a little bit more than I usually do in the evening. Uh, oh, this rum is just beautifully sweet, and mm, I feel slightly hedonist for saying this, but that might be my favourite nose of the tasting so far this morning. It definitely, definitely wouldn't be in the evening, but it smells like crunchy nut cornflakes. Hmm. Oh, that's not a thing in Canada either. Um, cornflakes with honey and crushed peanuts. Crunchy nut cornflakes. One of the best cereals in existence. Rob and Kelly, if you're watching this back in Edinburgh, get yourself a box of crunchy nut cornflakes. In fact, get me a box of crunchy nut cornflakes. I can't find them here. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. Brown butter. Brown butter. 
cinnamon, what are they called? They're little cinnamon balls, the, the candies. Mmm. Oh, that's an interesting one. That is the taste of roux. Yeah. So in cooking, uh, the, the in French cooking, uh, often with uh, sauces and things, you start off with what's called a roux, right? Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, it's basically um, butter and flour, really, uh, fried up together. This tastes a little bit like a roux before you add any any other crazy ingredients. Yeah, it's the fried butter and flour. That's really cool. Oh, that is peppery with this really nice, what, what fruit is that? They mentioned pomegranate molasses here. I'm not sure about pomegranate, but it's, it's more like a, like imagine like a date syrup or a fig syrup, fig balsamic, it's like fig balsamic. Hmm. It's like fig balsamic reduction served over vanilla ice cream, which if you have never had, and that sounds disgusting to you, do yourself a favor, try it. It tastes incredible. Balsamic vinegar and ice cream is one of the weirdest combinations. Oh, yeah, just, just, just a beautiful thing. All right. So what can I tell you about flaming rum bananas? Well, I told you it's Jamaican already. Ooh. I can tell you it's from a refill barrel. I can tell you it's seven years old. It was distilled on the 1st of May, 2010. There is an outturn of 273 bottles, although of course at the Strath we only got 12 and probably around 30, 36 or so came to Canada in total. An ABV of 66.1. Of course, rum being you know made of sugar cane, there's a lot more sugar in sugar um, than uh, than in barley, funny that. Um, so the, the ABVs often get quite high. 66.1 on this one, it's weirdly on the lower side for a seven-year-old rum at cast strength. And this one is R11.5, and we've actually had an R11 before. I forget the name of it now, it's about two years ago. It was, it was very good then, and this one is excellent now. This is from a Jamaican distillery called Worthy Park, and I'm about to put a picture up on the screen. Yeah. Worthy Park, as you can see, um, processed their own sugar cane. It's the estate of Worthy. Uh, Worthy Park Estate was actually established in 1670, making it by far and away the oldest company that we're tasting in uh, probably any outturn, not let alone this outturn. Um, the estate is over 10,000 acres of sugar cane growth. Uh, actually, sorry, it's 10,000 10, acres, and actually about half of that is sugar cane growth, my apologies. Um, and it was actually gifted to Lieutenant Francis Price, after service to Oliver Cromwell, <laughs> apparently. Um, actually, it just said Cromwell. Um, it might not be Oliver. It might have been his son. But seeing as his son only reigned for like 10 months, probably not. Um, but yeah, service to Cromwell. That's how old this, uh, this company is. Uh, when Jamaica was captured from the Spanish in 1655. Um, so yeah, really, really cool origin to the company. Um, they became a commercial sugar cane uh, producer in 1720 so you know even the actual company never mind just the the estate has a is, is older than anything else on the table um and they started making rum in the 1740s which means that you know what's the oldest the oldest whiskey the oldest licensed whiskey distillery was Strathila from 1786 this is 46 years potentially this so sorry 1740s it doesn't have an exact year but this is at least 36 years older than the oldest Scotch whiskey distillery. Who knew? I always thought rum was a much more modern thing. And then, then I remember everyone was drinking it in uh, in pretty much every every old movie. Uh, like, I say old movie, of course. Movies have only been around for 100 years. I mean, movies based on old things. I remember there's always a lot of rum being drunk in things like, um, uh, what's, that, what's that one about the, uh, the war against Spain? Ah, anyway. I can't remember the name of the thing. The uh, sharp, sharp, sharp with uh, Sean Bean. Watch sharp; it's amazing. They drink a lot of rum. Anyway, um, apparently, not only is it uh, a a large uh, sugar cane um, uh, establishment, they're also the number one rated sugar cane factory in Jamaica every single year since get this, nineteen sixty eight. Eight more years, 
and they've been they've been, they've been voted best what best uh, sugarcane factory every year for sixty years. That's incredible. That is abs absolutely astounding. I didn't do research. It's quite possible they're the only sugarcane factory on Jamaica. No, that, actually, that doesn't make any sense. Jamaica's quite big. Anyway, Worthy Park Rum, really quite good. This can be yours for one ninety two oh nine if there are any left. I very much recommend it if you're looking for a rum to fill out your collection. Yeah, a beautiful alternative. There are a few people, I mean, there's always going to be some people at a whiskey tasting who turn their nose up at a rum and don't really like it. There are a few of them, of course, on Sunday. So not the whole, you know, not everyone in the room liked this one. And hopefully at home by now you have an idea if you like rum or not. If you've got no idea if you like rum or not, try rum. You might be surprised. Um, but for those of you who do like rum, yeah, thoroughly, thoroughly recommend this one. Oh, rum. And we're now up to probably my favorite name of this month's tasting because I'm a big fan of both things that have been combined to create this. This is called Peterbix. It's a potent and classic example, I uh, thought the panel. The nose displays big, uncompromising notes of smoked applewood, bacon fat, barbecue char, bitumen, damp earth, and fresh rosemary. It develops into an intense farmyard edge uh, full of hayloft, cowshed, and old toolboxes, some WD-40 and burlap as well. Water gives honey roast parsnips, smoked flowers, and patchouli oil with a hint of myrrh. Um, not a single person in the room had actually smelt myrrh before. Apparently it's an incense. The mouth explodes with a soft organic peat, uh, hickory smoke, smoked oatmeal, and a bruising minerality. Notes of peated muesli, smoked butter, and cheese scones. With water, there is tar resin, sorrel, bay leaf, rhubarb jelly, cured game meats, and gentian eau de vie. A wonderful wee monster. And a wonderful wee monster it is indeed. Peter Bix, ladies and gentlemen, this is a 12-year-old lightly peated whiskey. <coughs> it is from a refill hogshead. I don't think we've had a hogshead yet. It's all been barrels so far, apart from the, the butt. We've had one butt, a bunch of barrels, and now finally a hogshead for this tasting. Slightly bigger cask than a barrel. This is from the 9th of March 2006. It's 12 years old with an outturn of 271 bottles, an ABV of 60.8%. It is cask 66.144. And many of you who are watching at home who know me think are already going, Adam's going to like this one. It's a 66. I've never not seen him like a 66. Yeah, you're right. I do like this one, especially as, as the, uh, the, the SWS panel quite rightly said. It's a classic example of this distillery. A little more farmyardy, maybe. Um, there was one person at the tasting on Sunday who uh, said it it smelt a little bit like setting a uh, a I think they refer to it as a cow pie, which I think is a hilarious term on fire. Um, love a farmyard edge to a whiskey. I think it's a really interesting note, and there's very few things I want to put in my mouth that taste like an old farmyard whiskey. Some for some reason that just works. It's 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 one of the greater whiskey asterisks is in my mind. As much as I do enjoy like iodine and other things that generally you wouldn't enjoy in a, in a, in a food or beverage, farmyard is probably my favorite. I think it's just a really interesting note. <sighs> Saying that though, there is a little bit of an iodine thing on the nose here. And I do like the honey roast parsnip note. Although parsnip notes in whiskey have been ruined for me a little bit ever since I visited uh, Shelter Point earlier this year, um, back in February, uh, before the outbreaks, uh, went up to uh, the Comox Whiskey Festival, hung out with uh, with Leon Webb, the distiller at Shelter Point, for a little while before we headed out there. And actually, we were with um, who were we with? It was uh, myself. There was Brett, of course, from the liquor store. Uh, my girlfriend Kristen and Food Quig were all hanging out with Leon, and uh, we actually tried uh, some North Korean whiskey which had some weird, like, health root thing, some kind of weird root in the bottom. Um, and it just tasted like moldy parsnips. It was disgusting. So I'm a little bit hesitant about parsnip in a whiskey note, but this this is this is bringing it back to me because I, I really, really enjoy this whiskey, regardless of the fact that I know there's a little bit of parsnip in it. Ordinarily, by the way, I do love parsnips. Just not moldy ones in North Korean whiskey. 
Oh, just as good as I remember from earlier this week. So 66 is Ardmore. Um, Ardmore, again, one of my, my personal favorites. Um, it was built in 1898 specifically by Adam Teacher for the PC component of his Teacher's Blend, um, the, the namesake family blend. Uh, these days, however, it's really quite hard to find, especially as seemingly the only official bottling that you could get in BC has now been discontinued. We can't get any more in BC as of right now. There, there's no SKU available for it. It's not in the warehouse. So um, Ardmore Legacy, it's... It was fun while it lasted, but it's it's apparently now gone. Um, I didn't get that news until after we were sold out, so I didn't even get a chance to buy one last bottle. Anyway, thankfully, companies like the SNWS are bringing us incredible Ardmores. Uh, we've had several this year already. We actually have two Ardmores in the whiskey sale, uh, one peated, one unpeated. Um, so, uh, yeah, check back on in the wee hours of Monday morning, and you might be able to get yourself an SNWS Ardmore from a previous release at a really good price. But this, is objectively, is better than either of those two Ardmores, personally speaking. Um, the other two Ardmores are also fantastic, but this this is one of the best SNWS Ardmores I've had in a while. Um, we had a really old one late last year, which was really, really good, but 12, apparently, is a good sweet spot for an Ardmore. This is, yeah, just just a beautiful creature. Yeah. So this can be yours for $180.78 for a peated 12-year-old whiskey. Damn good price. Um, you can pick that up right now if there are any available at uh, strathlicker.com forward slash SMWS. Or you can just go to strathlicker.com and search for the word Peterbix, P-E-A-T-A-B-I-X, and it should show up. If it doesn't show up, it means it's sold out, and I'm very sorry about that. Mm. Gorgeous, just gorgeous. All right. Oh, I should probably try it with water just for completion's sake. Yeah, it's still good. I haven't really changed much. But it's still good. All right, last whiskey of the day. We are heading into the peated, not lightly peated, but the full-on peated uh, section of the SWS here. This is anthracite seasoning dust. A warm simmer of fermenting citrus juices prickles the nose. Also, citrus rinds, chalk dusters, limoncello, tart green apple, cut grass, sourdough, peach pebbles, sorry, beach pebbles, um, smoldering twiglets. Uh, which is like a, a a British snack. It's like a weird misshapen breadstick, almost like a pretzel stick uh, with marmite on it. Uh, burning hay, clover honey, creel nuts, tar extract, gentian eau de vie again. Someone must have visited France and had a lot of gentian eau de vie and then joined the panel. Uh, scrunch newspaper and raw kiln peat smoke. Water brings smoked elastoplasts, canvas, pink sea salt in porridge, kippers, lemon juice on raw oysters, and liquid Maggie seasoning. Mixed with brine and malt vinegar. Unreduced, the palate is chock full of paraffin, tar, cod liver oil, beech wood, ash, carbolic soap, smoked white fish, salt, almonds, uh, gauze, antiseptic, anchovy paste, and peated marmite, which ever since I read that for the first time earlier this week, I, I've been basically daydreaming about the idea of peated marmite. That sounds incredible. Uh, water brings out a smoked menthol quality, dried seaweed, anthracite dust, Lime juice, aspirin tablets, crushed up with mineral salts, sheep wool doused in turpentine, eucalyptus, white mushrooms, and green peppercorns. Now, for those who are uninitiated to the, the wonders of Isla-style whiskey, this is an Isla, by the way, um, a lot of those will sound absolutely terrifying um, tasting notes. Uh, uh, raw oysters, not necessarily, you don't necessarily want to drink something that says like raw oysters, paraffin. Get a little iffy. But for those of you who know the beautiful character of Isla, this is one not to be missed. This is one of the ones that went to a draw. It, this is this was a, a really, really popular uh, expression um, when we had it earlier this week. I'm looking at Peterbix again. Hang on. Let's, let me get the right one. And uh, yeah, 
this is just just stunning. This is a 10 year old from Isla um, from the 20th of February 2009, one of 304 bottles with an ABV of 58.6. This is 53.314. Kalila. Salt and vinegar chips or crisps is, uh, is the first thing that came to mind for me. Yeah, it's like salt and vinegar crisps around some kind of bonfire on which you've thrown bandages for some reason. The only kindling you could find was the bandages in the in the old first aid kit in the back of the car. I'm building a narrative now. This is great. Uh, yeah, it's really good. It's it's very very Isla. Um, a lot of the room guessed that this was a Lafroig, actually. And if you went into this thinking it's going to be a Lafroig and getting ready for the price tag, the fact that this is only $199.91 will probably delight a lot of people. Um, so, yeah. Kalila, a very well known uh, distillery to SWS members. We get an awful lot of them. A fact, the fact that this is 53.314, we've had 314 Kalilas in the SWS. A uh, very, very popular story, and one that the SNWS know that we want to continue um, getting. Uh, I believe they've doubled down on their stocks of Kalila to make sure that we always have a decent amount of it going forward, uh, which is probably why the price has dropped a little bit as well. This is a really, really strongly priced Kalila. And I think uh, earlier this year from the last uh, last batch that we uh, we got, we were looking at uh, a good 10 to 15% more than this for a similar 10-year-old, so... It's nice that the price has uh, settled a little bit. Mm. Yeah, that is just delightful. And yeah, it's making me ready for lunch. What a seaweed, actually. I had, uh, I had sushi last night for Christmas. Uh, we, uh, we went out for, for sushi. It was Christian's birthday. So we, uh, we found one of our favorite sushi restaurants that was open and had pretty good... Uh, COVID safety rules, and we uh, we had quite a lot of Japanese food. And this this is reminding me of some of the uh, some of the the rolls, the seaweed. Mm. Very nice, very nice indeed. Yeah, so one hundred and ninety nine dollars and ninety one cents for this anthracite seasoning dust. It is available as are all of the bottles, unless they're already sold out at strathlicker.com forward slash smws. I'm going to put a screen up with what is a what has uh, been released, and play a little bit of music uh, for you to enjoy in the background whilst you uh, place your orders. Thank you again to Robin Kelly for bringing all of these in. It's an absolute pleasure and a delight to be uh, to be tasting such wonderful whiskies every month. It always makes me look forward to the beginning of every month, which is nice because at the end of every month I have to you know count a bunch of whiskey and do inventory. So it's always nice that you know every time I'm doing inventory and I'm you know here at seven o'clock in the morning going beep. Beep. I'm thinking in the back of my head, this means I get to have SNWS whiskey soon. It makes it all better. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much to Robin Kelly for bringing these in. Uh, thank you to all of our local members for uh, joining in and supporting the SNWS, especially through these uh, interesting times. It's been an absolute pleasure to be your host today here on YouTube. And uh, yeah, our whiskey sale starts in just a couple of days. So check out uh, strathlicker.com for details on our whiskey sale. We have a a big PDF booklet that you can download and with everything's linked, you can you can click on everything and it'll take you straight to the page to try and buy it uh, or commiserate on the fact that it's already sold out. Um, good luck in the sale. Uh, good luck getting the outturn bottles from uh, the November outturn that you enjoy. And thank you. We'll see you all next month for outturn 110, I guess. I can't believe we're at 110 already. See you later. The winter sun shines on the oaks and the birch At Edwin Stowe's chapel, St. Mary's Church The wind blows slowly 
As the meat and spine flow By the stone that was planted A thousand moons ago Traveling back To the land of my fathers Where the fir trees grow high Far above Hey. Yeah.